Our next session will be on fixed wing electric aircraft, which we all uh, see already in the air. And we all think that this is something which uh, will come the next uh, step, probably before the EV tolls. Uh, there have been already last year uh, the certification of the uh, Pipistrel um, uh, Velis. Uh, in the CSLSA class, and we see that this aircraft is sold uh, quite wide around the world. We heard several times about uh, um, Pipistrel, so this time we invited some other uh, competitors in this field who will want to bring up certified electric aircraft in uh, different fields. I see my first speaker, the vice president of uh, the Beijing Institute of Technology, Mr. Zhang Li, Yu, Li Yuo, uh, is uh, already ready. I see his slides are on the screen. So for saving time, I hand the word over to you and uh, in interest to listen what you have to say about this subject. Thank you. Now you switched off the video. Anyway, but maybe you can start speaking because I think the video now has been switched off of the speaker. Hello? Hello? Hey, Hello?各位专家,各位这个业界同仁啊,大家下午好。首先感谢这个陈鹏总啊,这个搭建这样一个国际舞台啊,让大家在这里头呢,呃,共同探讨这个电动航空的一个发展啊。E-flight. I have over 11 experience in e-flight industry and uh, previously uh, Rich Xing is a model that I worked with uh, President Yang. So uh, in the general aviation industry, I've been involved with various fields, including the R&D certification as well as operation. There are a lot of things I can I'd like to share with you. So the topic of my speech is the development trend of e-flight and uh, the key technologies of propulsion system. There are three chapters. First of all, I would introduce the development trend of e-flight. This is mainly based on our previous experience. First of all, there is a diversity of um, energy source, including hybrid. Hybrid. It's going to be a mainstream in the next 10 to 20 years, especially in the long range um, segment. And uh, some experts point out that for the endurance of over 800, hybrid power has a very good advantage, especially in the uh, military use and uh, um, long distance of UAV transportation. Hybrid power is very advantageous. And another energy source is lithium battery. And uh, the last one is um, electric hybrid, solar lithium battery. So um, the second trend is the distribution scattering of the power units. So um, the, we have a lot of explorations and imaginations on the uh, power system, and uh, a lot of things are being very destructive, and a lot of aircrafts look very strange. However, they are still viable. And uh, the next trend is that um, the platform is getting more and more intelligent. 
In the future, we don't really need to learn how to drive an aircraft. We only need to know how to go up, go down, go forward, and、uh, go backward. That's very simple, and、uh, we don't really need to use a camera to take a very good photography. In the future, the aircraft. So, if it is still so complicated, which requires hundreds of hours of studying, aircraft will not be able to enter into the mass market. And、uh, the key challenge that we encounter is that we still there is still not a rigid demand of from the market. This is a major pain point. In the future. I hope that with the platform getting more intelligent, we will be able to have aircraft enter the mass market, and、uh, you can see that the design is getting more and more diversified. For example, there are different geometries and different design, different look. So、uh, there are fixed wing and、uh, compound wing and、uh, tilt wing. And tilt wing is going to be a mainstream in the future. I know many companies, whether it's major companies or the startups, are focusing on the tilt wings. And then there are the multi rotor. This is already very mature now. So that really depends on how we are going to match with the market demand. And、uh, the second chapter I'm going to introduce is the technological system of the e-flight motor and controller technology. So、uh, this is just like mobile phone. You can see that there are、um, different types of charger. How can we、uh, charger connector? Well, actually, we need a standardization of the charger inlet. We have a very systematic research in the standardization, and in the future, we will collaborate with Wallon and other companies to make an industrial standard of the、um, aircraft motor. First of all, the voltage. There are different categories of voltage level. So, first of all, low voltage, ah,、uh, lower than sixty volt, and this is mainly、um, used for the. Um, this is mainly used the、um, radio. Motor and、uh, it is a air cooling system and、uh, usually we use P B L D C controller and this kind of、uh, motor and controller we should really confirm with the manufacturer to、uh, confirm the environment use environment of this kind of motor and controller because、uh, usually. What's written on the package is about the power that you use when it is in the ideal environment. So we. We need to、um, look at the difference between the ideal environment and your environment. And、uh, the second type is the medium voltage.、Uh, usually, it is around one hundred volt. And、uh, mostly, they are seventy-two, ninety-six, and one hundred and forty-four. And、uh, usually, the、uh, major cooling method is air cooling, and、uh, this kind of aircraft system is used in the big power industrial UAV, and、uh, some of them are ten kilowatt、uh, distributed aircraft. However, the main major mainstream will be the high voltage category, which is uh three hundred fifty, six hundred, and eight hundred. And、uh, these 
technological system done by Professor Shang. Have um, uh, Professor Shang has done a lot of research on it, and uh, we also expect a standardization of this category. And uh, for the motor and controller that is above 280 kilowatt or even higher, this is the major usage. And uh, um, there are uh, radio motor, double road, uh, and uh, single stator. So usually we use the FOC controller and uh, we use IGBT. And sometimes we also use uh, carbonized silicon. And in terms of the structure of the motor, there are also two systems. The first one is radio magnetic motor. The advantages of this um, technology is that after topography, we are able to realize a lightweight design and which ensures the strength, but also lower down the weight. And uh, also the permanent magnetic um, used the hull back to make us um, remove the rotor. And uh, we are also able to use a very high efficient internal oil cooling or water cooler to improve the, the heating capability of it. So um, we have an integrated design of the propeller and uh, motor and uh, the power density will be above 10. And if the protection level is high, then the power density will be high. Another structure is the axle structure. And uh, there are four advantages. And uh, because uh, this special nature of the structure, we are able to lower down the um, metal consumption of the motor and uh, also the different block of these technologies, we can also lower down the turbo loss and also the in sync water cooling technology also improves the, the heating capability of the motor. But um, the structure is very complex and uh, the cover or the lid is the key component of the motor and uh, it is not possible to really um, cut down the weight of the cover. Next, I'm going to introduce the key technologies because our team has been researching these topics for over four years. And uh, first of all, the axle motor. After an accurate calculation, we are able to understand the rotor stator and also the radio diagram. And uh, by coupling calculation, we know the temperature elevation and also the noise. The next is the loss calculation. This is also a very important technology. By this calculation, we will be able to know the copper loss, machinery loss, and uh, also the wiring loss. And uh, we will be able to better design the thermal management. And then the deheating structure is also very important. We also have um, systematic research. So there are inner and outer circulation water cooling structure. We will be able to know the flow speed distribution of the water cooling and also the pressure distribution. 
And by looking at the flow distribution and the pressure distribution, we will have a better balance of the flow. And about the design of structure and the intensity. So for motors, this is a difficult point because it has to integrate into the cooling systems. And another key technology is the controllers. So controllers is highly relevant to the motor. We want to improve the overall efficiency. So initially we chose the motor of Slovenia and the controllers from Germany. But it causes a lot of trouble for us. And we also have four types of E motors 30, 60, 140, and 280 kilowatt. For the 30 and the 60 kilowatt, we have completed all of the tests and the production. And we also have cells. And for the 60 kilowatt, we have the small quantity production. Oh, and we have the certification from the third party rather than CAC. And we have also the production of the wheel type motor. And about my institution, my school is led by President Wang Dongsheng and several academicians. And we have academician Xiang Changle as the dean of the school. And we have more than 10 years of R&D in e-motors and also more than 20 years of R&D and production of the e-motor. For the achievement translation, um, that the translation of the achievement is responsible by the Beijing Xing Yihua Aircraft Company. In 2018, I left the, this company for the Beijing University of uh, Beijing Institute of Technology. And we are devoted to the integration of the new energy controlling systems. And we would like to provide high power controlling systems. And we can help the customers to choose the propellers. And we can provide integrated system solutions. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much, much. Um, for this nice overview of what's happening. And I know uh, you are also or have been involved, like you said, in the RX4E project where we have had several times presenting at the eFlight Forum, which is a Chinese project now working on a four-seater. And we heard some information yesterday. Now, our uh, next speaker, Martin, if you could switch off on your camera that I can see you and your microphone. Martin Freeling from Diamond Aircraft. Ah, here you are, ah, here you are. Ah, ah, hello, and uh, uh, good to see you again. And we had Martin presenting last year, and it was a big surprise, uh, or not a surprise, because Diamond was working on electric aircraft for a while. For a while. But last, last year, year you had the, for the first time, released the vision and the project, the project. having the EA40 uh, electrified. Uh, um, electrified. This uh, is this supposed to be an aircraft in the Part 3 class. And so um, maybe you try sharing your screen and then if you share your screen, the stage is yours and you will explain what you're doing. What interesting background information why you do this, perhaps for our, perhaps for our visitors and viewers that uh, Diamond Aircraft 
is an Austrian company, a leading European company in fixed wing uh, aircraft in the part uh, industry class, in training the class, industry class um, training and class. Diamond uh, is since uh, I think three years, two and a half, three years now, owned mainly by a Chinese uh, uh, owner. So you're also between the two worlds, like we with the forum. So I see your screen is up. I mute my mic and I leave the stage to you. Good. Yeah, thanks uh, for the introduction, uh, Willy. And uh, good morning to everybody who's listening in from, from Europe and good afternoon to the audience in, in China. Um, it's a pleasure that I'm allowed to speak here on this uh, forum again. Um, my name is Maarten Freiling uh, and I'm uh, the technical lead of the um, electric DA40 project here at uh, Diamond Aircraft. And in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you a bit more about uh, some technical details and also why we as Diamond decided to invest and move forward um, in this technology. But first a bit about our, our history, because Diamond has actually quite a rich history in terms of um, alternative fuels, alternative um, electrification technologies, hybrid drivetrains, as well as electric uh, drivetrains. And it all started back in 2011 with the DA36 E-Star, which was the world's first aircraft with a serial hybrid electric drive uh, system. And we um, collaborated as part of a um, um, research and development project, funded project together with Siemens uh, back then. And with these, this aircraft, we demonstrated the uh, hybrid flight principle, uh, meaning that with a relatively small combustion engine uh, powered just for cruise, you are able to um, maintain sustained flight. And with the electric motor, you can provide some boost power uh, in order to keep flying. This aircraft was quickly followed in 2013 with the E-Star 2, um, which is actually an improved version of it, uh, more range, more payload. And um, it really showed us what was possible with this technology. So that's why we continued with HEMAP, uh, which stands for Hybrid Electric Multi-Engine Plane, which was the world's first twin um, engine serial hybrid um, aircraft in 2018. And you could kind of see this trend moving forward uh, in being the first. And that's what we tried to achieve also with the EDA40, becoming the first certified full CS23. And with full, I mean uh, both IFR, uh, VFR and IFR certified uh, full electric aircraft. And that's the project uh, we're working on at the moment. But first, why electric? Well, purely because it um, provides quite some value to our customers. Um, electric offer, aircraft offer a significant value to operators when compared to, say, combustion engine aircraft. And the key benefits include uh, reduced operating costs, um, simpler maintenance, which translates into a higher uptime of these aircraft, and most importantly, and that's really driving it, um, the environmental factors. So um, lower emi order, no, no emissions, and also lower noise production. And why, uh, why now? Well, it also has to do with the, say, the battery development trends. And um, there's well-established trends in the electric battery space, which are accelerating at the moment. So the battery prices are, are falling. And at the meantime, the um, capacities, energy densities are increasing. And also over regulators are becoming more acquainted with the use of uh, such battery systems as um, a proposed energy source in, uh, in aircraft. And the result is, is that um, at this moment, all electric aircraft are already commercially viable um, in certain applications. And um, it's actually likely to expand into other uh, segments in the near future. And that's also what, what this forum is about. I've heard interesting stories about, uh, about larger, say, um, commuter style aircraft, about um, eVTOL, and that's definitely where the trend is heading at the moment. Then a bit about, about our customers, because uh, a big group of the uh, people flying our aircraft, uh, the Diamond Fleet, are flight screws. And these are perfectly suited for the adaptation of electric aircraft. And why? Because right now there's a high demand in, in flight training. Um, and also that these flying schools operate on a narrow margin, meaning that they uh, benefit uh, from lower operating costs. Um, they also benefit from um, uh, less frequent maintenance intervals, which um, is also a benefit of electric powertrains because um, the electric motors are relatively simple. 
um, and also result in less maintenance compared to a complex combustion engine. And finally, emission laws are tightening, uh, not only uh, gas emissions, but also uh, noise emissions. I do want to mention right now is that the EDA40, uh, so this electric version of the EDA40, uh, will not be a direct replacement of the combustion engine um, counterpart. Um, instead, it's seen as a add-on to the diamond training family. Uh, so basically the EDA40, the electric version, can be used in really the first phase of pilot training um, for all flights operating in the vicinity of the airfield. So uh, for example, uh, circuit training, uh, local flights, etc. cetera. Um, at a certain moment, a pilot will need to uh, fly for longer durations, uh, longer range, and that's where the pilot or student pilot will transition to the combustion engine counterpart and finish his pilot training there. So this, um, if you translate that into requirements, it basically means you need to have an aircraft that can be used in flight training with an endurance somewhere between one and two hours, capable of both VFR operations as well as IFR. And um, changing that into a product requirement means um, that we want an aircraft with at least uh, 60 minutes endurance with reserve, as well as having the ability to either quickly change or quickly charge a battery, uh, ensuring that the aircraft can fly um, as much as possible. So um, this brings me to the EDA40. Um, what exactly is it? It's uh, currently um, an all electric two seat uh, basic service of training. Um, two seat in the initial phase, that's how we're gonna uh, do the initial certification. However, the fuselage is uh, capable of, uh, of course, having four occupants within it. And the idea is, is as battery technology is evolving uh, further, um, we are planning to actually provide an upgrade to either the endurance of the aircraft or uh, in, ter in terms of payload, um, allowing for more than two seats. And within the, the CS23 class, we will be fully prepared uh, to do that. Um, this aircraft will also include a fast charge battery system um, with, uh, I'll come to that later, uh, with a expected turn turnaround or a charge time of uh, 20 minutes or less for this aircraft, which is uh, very important when utilizing it in a um, flight training environment. Um, some specifications, so the takeoff power is going to be uh, similar to the uh, DA40NG, um, payload of 190 kilograms for this two-seat initial version. And we try to keep the control and cockpit layout um, similar or identical to the DA40NG, and that makes it possible for um, students transitioning from an electric version to the uh, combustion engine version um, to, this, to do this conversion with, um, um, to convert very easily. And we plan to have the certification uh, finished by the end of 2023, so within the next two years. Then a bit more detail about the battery system uh, we're using. Well, we've partnered up with uh, Electronic Power Systems. Um, it's a US-based company dedicated uh, into providing power solutions uh, for aviation. And their system will include the battery modules, um, high voltage battery uh, management units, uh, disconnects, low voltage power distribution, ventilation of the system, um, et cetera. And we're actually quite excited to partner up with them because um, they have a quite extensive uh, portfolio at this moment. And up to now, they have a perfect safety record in field, which is very promising. Um, the system we'll be using is a 800 volt DC um, uh, system voltage, which compared to say these 400 volt uh, DC systems uh, results in less current losses as well as low, lower cable masses of the system. The idea of these battery modules is that we'll use multiple of them and you can mechanically connect them together in, in, in a row. Um, and this also includes say, the connections for communication and high voltage and that saves on the complex wiring and saves weight as well. The capacity will be around 80, 85 kilowatt hours, uh, which ensures an endurance of up to 90 minutes. Um, and the batteries right now uh, are located, um, or we plan to have them located in a belly pot underneath the fuselage, meaning that the um, cabin space remains, um, um, that we, we have enough cabin space remaining for um, um, a future upgrade to uh, more than two seats. 
Um, cycle life right now is um, estimated at around uh, more than 2,000 cycles, which is around 3,000 flying hours. However, um, early tests have shown that uh, this is probably a conservative value, and we expect it to increase um, as we get these aircraft flying. And then a bit about redundancy. Um, safety is a very important aspect in, in, in aviation, and um, we plan to have a, a so-called double string battery system, um, meaning that if uh, half of the battery system is allowed to fail and it will not result in a full loss of power and especially in single engine aircraft that's a very interesting um, um, idea um, of having a um, not having to account for a full uh, powertrain failure so where does that bring us in uh, practice well in practice um, the operating costs are going to be drastically reduced uh, our estimations show that it can be up to 40 percent compared to traditional uh, piston aircraft and this is this is basically due to the lower maintenance costs as well as the low fuel or energy costs and especially as um, um, we get more and more electric aircraft and infrastructure at airports we also expect there's going to be some some funding um, available or um, um, say some 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 cheaper way of getting energy also in terms of um, sustainable uh, in sustainable ways and then a bit about charging um, one of the reasons why we also partner up with this EP power system is that they are able to offer a very fast charge uh, system, uh, being able to completely charge the aircraft within 20 minutes. And um, this 20 minute point is an important selling point because that's basically the time the aircraft is on the ground anyway, between switching between students. So um, the idea is, is within the, the briefing and debriefing time of, of a student pilot, the aircraft will be uh, charge of the batteries will be preconditioned um, for the next flight. I would like to conclude with a small uh, video, um, just basically introducing the EDA authority. All right. Um, thanks uh, a lot for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have uh, later on um, when we have time for it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin. And very interesting how good the progress is since uh, we heard about the aircraft last year uh, about at the same time. And if you think we are in uh, COVID times, uh, really congratulations to the progress you have had done there. Our next speaker, uh, Kalin, if you could get online. Oh, you um, hear me? Yes, I hear you. I uh, try you to uh, put a video. Yes, I, I don't get see. a. Now you are in. We see your video. Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, and so we hear I present you. from my computer? Yes, this would be what we suggest. Um, and just a little introduction, Kalin is working on electric aircraft already quite a long time here from Germany. He had with his very first aircraft, we had it at Aero at the E-Flight Expo already nearly 10 years ago. And he is uh, now working also on a training aircraft like Diamond, but in a different class, in the ultralight class. So if you could share your screen, I hand the mic over to you and you tell us because you know much more to say good things about yourself than I can do. So uh, if you go, yeah, just presentation mode. You see? Okay, perfect. See the present. Yes, we see the presentation mode. So stage is yours. I mute myself now. 
Hello, my name is Kalin Gologan. I am a CEO of company Electra Solar together with Konstantin Kondak. And uh, we present our new product, Electra Trainer, which will be introduced at the Aero this year in Friedrichshafen. You see here a picture. Uh, a little of the history of our company. Uh, Electra Solar is a spin off of the German Aerospace Center DLR, Institute for Robotics and Mechatronics. And the roots of the company are in 2011 uh, under the name of PCRO GmbH. And the first aircraft from us, the Electra One, was flying in March 2011. You see here a picture after the first flight with the test pilot John Karkov. Then we founded the Electra UIS for unmanned aircraft systems. And uh, in 2016, we merged both companies under the name Electra Solar. So the roots are in PCRO. In 2015, we flew with Electra One over the Alps. And uh, we have another aircraft, Electra Two Solar. Uh, first flight took place in 2017. We delivered to Switzerland under the name of Solar Stratos. Uh, 2019, with the Electra Two Solar unmanned version, we flew 10 kilometer altitude completely autonomously including start and landing, touchdown. This was a high performance, only with the energy of the sun. In October 2021, we received the German ultralight certification for the Electra One Solar, according to the new regulation LTF UL 2020. As we know, this is, according to this regulation, the first uh, certified ultralight aircraft electric in the world. You see here some picture of Electra One Solar flying since uh, 10 years. Now certified is a one seat aircraft with very good performance. I don't want to tell too much, much about this. Here you see uh, Electra Two Solar, the aircraft delivered in Switzerland, uh, which with a goal to fly uh, two years in the stratospheric with pilot Rafael Donjan. You see here how he jumps from the aircraft. Uh, this can be used also as a normal solar glider with more than 12 hours endurance. You see the unmanned version here. One picture from 10,000 meters altitude is a stratospheric altitude, a stratospheric aircraft with the possibility to fly uh, 20 kilometer high. Uh, also very important is uh, Electra Solar owns the whole intellectual property of this aircraft, from the structure to electric power unit, motor, motor controller and battery, autopilot system for unmanned aircraft, ground control station and solar power unit. This is, we can see our strong point that we have in-house everything uh, from structure to electric power unit, autopilot, hardware and software. Now, Electra Trainer. Uh, why we start this aircraft? Because we saw that in the next year will be a high demand for trainer aircraft electric with low operation costs. Uh, practically, this aircraft is a modified version of Electra One, so that from, from the certification point of view, we have a big advantage. We have no, no developed and certification risk. We did this process with Electra One. We need only to repeat it for a little skate. It's a little wider fuselage. Uh, the wings, uh, similar with Electra One, only reinforced. And uh, from the philosophy, we want to have a high end aerodynamic. A glide ratio is over 21. For this reason, the energy to fly in a training cycle acceptance climb is only 12 kilowatt for a cruise speed of 120 kilometers per hour. We have a big backup battery package of 25 kilowatt hours, and this uh, provides a flight endurance of 2.5 hours, uh, including reserve. We, we are, which, what are the highlights of our aircraft? At first, I want to say whisper silent. The noise level is 25, 555 decibel. When the aircraft is flying at 300 meter altitude, don't hear. 
It's similar with Electra 1, which was in Electra 1, we had a noise level of 55 decibel. We have a robust structure. We have an efficient, reliable, redundant propulsion system. The redundancy of our propulsion system is in the motor. We have a dual motor, two rotors on one axis. We have an each side has its own controller and own battery system. So we have a redundancy on all the level from motor up to battery. Our range is 300 kilometer endurance, I mentioned 2.5. We have a very large cabin, cabin 1.25 meter wide and accommodates two meter pilots. Wonderful view outside. And very important, we have a portable charging station. We, we charge with 12 kilowatt. We can charge also 18, but normal 12 kilowatt and weights 12 kilogram. And this we could then put in the battery package and you can load with normal, uh, normal plug 220 volt or four plugs, but also with 380 volt. So from the logistic point of view, it's a huge advantage. We have a very short takeoff and landing. We are quite good powered under 200 meter and uh, long battery life. And very important for logistic is also assembly time. This aircraft will be assembled from one person in 30 minutes. We have special tools how to assembly. And uh, this is for logistic and for clubs and very important. Important for us, we designed this aircraft also for good training cycle. So 50 minute flight, 30 minute charge with 12 kilowatt. And this is very important. I will present a diagram here. Operation cost. We calculate very carefully the operation cost, including depreciation of the aircraft, including battery, the battery cost, including electricity, hangar cost, insurance, everything. And we are only at 65 euro per hour. And this is a very good value. And if we, a normal aircraft in this class has an operation cost of 100 euro, and if we redistribute this on the whole life of the aircraft, we can say that the customer's share uh, saves in the whole life of the aircraft about uh, 350,000 euro. And for this, this was practical an aircraft designed for very low operation cost. Now look on this aircraft. Uh, here I simulated a training, six hours training per day. I consider one hour training 50 minutes, then come down, we start with 35 kilowatt, 32 kilowatt. We don't charge the battery up to the limit. We, uh, then we land after 50 minutes, 30 minutes charge, then a co a, another 50. So you see the first half left with three hours of flight. During the lunch time, we charge full the battery, 1.5 hours. And afternoon, another three hours at the end, we still land with 14 kilowatt hour, enough reserve. And this is very important. If you see, we charge and discharge the battery in flight with only 0.34 C, the 12 kilowatt. And this is a guarantee for long life. And for this reason, we don't need a, a liquid cooling. We have a simple air cooling and we save battery life. So technical specification, uh, the optimum cruise speed is low, it's 120 km per hour. It's in the region of the best flight ratio. But of course, we can fly up to 180 km or more. PDA, uh, the glide ratio, 25. Uh, then empty weight 400 kilogram, maximum weight 600 kilogram, a wingspan of 13.5, uh, optionally extension winglets 40.5, propeller diameter 1.75 uh, meter, and certification according to the new gen uh, regulation LTF well 220. We have a retractable landing gear electrically and uh, we have parachute include flap also retractable 
for also electrical retractable stream retractable. Project status, we, uh, we finalized the design, we uh, built now the prototype, in, we are in the end phase of, 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 of prototype building and we present the aircraft at the Friedrich Safan Aero 222 this year, next year. And the German ultra certification is uh, planned for summer next year. We just have the first orders. And we expect that uh, the market in, uh, in this sector will be very good in the next year. Of course, after delivering some few aircraft in this class, we are following also uh, the other certification in the CS LSA. So this was a short presentation. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer to you. So hi, Kalin, thank you very much. And very interesting project. And later, uh, we we just covered also a lot of information on this on our eFly journal, which is one of the magazines supporting the eFly forum. And uh, so I think as you're just in time, we will talk about this later. Now we should go to our next speakers uh, to keep the timing. And this is now. Uh, we had a, an ultralight aircraft, we had a part 23 aircraft, we know there is already a, a CSLSA in electric. Kalin, your screen is still short. If you could end the screen sharing would be great. And I ask now next on stage would be uh, um, Andrea Stromeyer, who also has been from the University of Stuttgart, who also has been presenting uh, uh, several times. Um, uh, Kalin, I think your screen is still, uh, your PPT is still on the screen. You have to stop the screen sharing. I think, uh, yes, that's done. Perfect. Hello, Andreas. Uh, sorry that we can't see uh, again in China because you have been traveling to our ev real event in China already. And uh, I think we both like it more seeing in real, having good food and talking to the people. But uh, we take that what we have, which is the presence here. And you have some very interesting project, which I think started recently. You had uh, several electric projects on the university. Um, if you try to share or if you share your screen, then I would let you explain, because you know much better than me, uh, what you're working on. Yes, the screen is coming up, so I'm off. Stage Very good. Is Thank you, Willi. Thank you for the introduction. You see my presentation mode there? Yes, yes, we see it fine. Very good. So um, welcome to all of you. It's really a shame that I cannot be with you in China. I would love to. Um, Funny enough, I'm, I think I just sit two kilometers away from Kalin, who is just in the same city, and uh, we could have lunch together <laughs> uh, as a compensation. So um, while we have uh, seen presentations, and we'll see one more presentation on flying aircraft, actual flying aircraft, and we also have actual flying aircraft, electric and hybrid electric in Stuttgart, I will talk now about uh, something larger, something a bit further ahead with an entry into service uh, in uh, about 15 to 20 years from now. I will talk about uh, a 50 seat regional aircraft. This is a high, uh, Horizon 2020 funded project, footprint uh, future propulsion and integration towards a hybrid electric 50 seat regional aircraft. So I will talk about uh, what do we want to do with this project? And then I will give you some insight in this uh, small 15 minutes I have here. Uh, for, uh, for what we are doing right now, so the current status and uh, what's still ahead of us in the next, in the coming year. The current time shows more than ever how much we need travel and aviation to have an exchange, to have uh, meetings in person, think something we, we did not have for the last almost two years now, uh, not too much at least. So there is uh, a need for travel, there is a need for aviation as a key component for development and resilience in the world, worldwide. And aviation is part and will be part of a worldwide intermodal transport network. 
On the other hand, and we are fully aware of this, and uh, looking at the new German government, for example, also there, like in Europe, in Brussels, uh, sustainability and uh, climate change is a big topic. So clean aviation is required to support the sustainable development. And in this context, uh, we have Footprint 50, uh, how we can uh, contribute uh, to this, so both the uh, mobility and uh, sustainability with a hybrid electric 50 seat regional aircraft. We are a consortium of uh, 15 partners spread throughout the world. So uh, Europe, Russia, Brazil, Canada, the States. Um, coordinated by University of Stuttgart. And our aim is uh, threefold. First of all, the aircraft. So uh, um, hybrid electric powertrain in a regional aircraft 50 seat uh, capacity. Um, the tools and the models to develop aircraft and, uh, and uh, the powertrain itself. And uh, then we have three technologies picked out of that which is energy storage, which is energy harvesting and thermal management. So we look at key technologies. We look also at the regulatory framework and at uh, research infrastructures required to get this in as entry into service uh, 2035. So 15 years from now, 14 years from now, um, we have to speed up to, um, to get this complex task achieved in this size of aircraft. So, of course, uh, having designed and built aircraft before, an aircraft is more than just the hybrid electric powertrain, but of course, and we do all the development work for a viable aircraft. But of course, uh, this project is focused on the powertrain with energy storage, with energy harvesting, and with thermal management. And uh, to get this, to achieve this goal, we work with uh, model-based systems engineering, MBSE, and therefore we have put ourselves a mission statement. We'll go through it briefly. So uh, we want to develop a synergetic aircraft design, synergetic in a way that uh, the integration of this powertrain has synergies with the airframe. Otherwise, what you will learn if you do work on these kind of aircraft, uh, the more components you add, uh, the more efficiency you might lose if you do not look for these synergies. So we want to develop a synergetic airframe uh, aircraft design for a uh, commercial region hybrid electric aircraft for 50 seats, entry into service 2035-2040. And uh, we want to identify the key enabling technologies and also a roadmap for the regulatory aspects. So there's also the certification aspect and the operational aspect, what regulations would be required for such kind of aircraft. Um, this design shall help accelerate and integrate hybrid electric aircraft and technologies to achieve a sustainable competitive aviation growth. So we still want to grow, but this has to be sustainable and at the same time competitive. And um, we want to um, incentivize to, 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 to uh, uh, speed up regulators, air traffic management and energy suppliers to prepare for the challenge to come. Our aircraft, of course, leading in emissions and noise, um, safe, no doubt, it is still an aircraft, so operational safety is uh, without compromise. Um, we have to look for competitive operational cost, which is not uh, a self-running uh, task, so this we have to look how we can achieve. Um, operational improvements uh, compared to current regional aircraft and um, we uh, want to also look at the, what is required, what changes are required to the current infrastructure, and there we want to limit. Current status of the work, just briefly, we have looked, uh, so we are in the second, so we have finished the second of three years. In the first year, we have looked into what do we want to build, so top level aircraft requirements. We have set out the requirements for the aircraft itself. We have set out uh, environmental requirements, so emission reductions, noise reductions, that could be uh, requested from such an aircraft. We have defined um, specific flight missions, which will help us now that we are developing the aircraft, help us now for uh, mission simulations. So uh, different missions with uh, specific tasks. So there's a design range, 400 kilometers is the range for our aircraft. But uh, with our Russian partners, we have learned that 400 kilometers in this vast country is not really, uh, uh, 
interesting or would not deliver to the real task. So there has to be the option to have uh, also 800 kilometers. We have looked into missions with cold operations, hot and high missions, extreme cold operations. Uh, so we always have looked for city pairs that, uh, uh, that could have these extreme requirements. Uh, mountainous terrain, that means a steep climb after takeoff and steep approach. Uh, island operations, which means then that uh, you would have to fly forth and back uh, without refueling in case of uh, no landing possible at the, at the island. So uh, we have to see how this can be done and short takeoff and landing operations. Figures of merit. So if we develop the aircraft, how do we, um, how do we assess whether we have a good design or not, whether we achieve our targets? So we have tried to put um, the different um, uh, evaluation aspects into a formula, a, a figure of merit that allows a full comparison. And uh, the major factors are the emissions, are the cost, and also on the realization side, development, certification, and production aspects that we try to uh, bring into this evaluation, uh, which will finally define which way to go for such an aircraft that shall fly 2035. We also uh, have defined a, a conventional aircraft for comparison, so uh, a reference aircraft, where we have uh, um, ported the, the today's state of the art to 2040, 2040. And uh, uh, so conventional technologies, but improved so that we do a, a apples to apple comparison. If we have our aircraft with a hybrid electric powertrain and uh, all the synergies we, we try to bring into this airframe so that we compare this to a future aircraft, not to today's aircraft or to an aircraft that's already 40 years old. Um, in terms of aircraft design, what we have done so far, we have uh, looked into seven different powertrain architectures. What is a powertrain architecture? It starts from energy storage, where you could have batteries, uh, uh, hydrogen capacitors, so whatever you, however you, you store your, your energy, then power conversions like uh, uh, combustion, like uh, fuel cell, uh, so different means of, of conversion, distribution, uh, also distribution in terms of voltage. We have seen an 800 voltage, voltage aircraft there at Diamond before. So which voltage is the right one is a question. And then uh, the propulsor integration. So is it conventional propulsion just uh, in a parallel architecture or is it uh, uh, direct combustion of hydrogen or is it distributed electric propulsion? So we have uh, different means uh, and we have looked into these architectures, have uh, assessed and have designed the aircraft from that, have looked at the impact of each of these architectures on the airframe uh, and the aircraft configuration, and um, then came to a down selection of three architectures which are priori uh, priori prioritized now for preliminary design, so to go a bit further, deeper into preliminary design with three different goals, as you can see there. There's one on the left side, uh, carbon neutral, which means we have sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, we also have battery for uh, electric propulsion in addition to the conventional uh, combustion engines, turboprop engines with sustainable aviation fuel. That's, uh, let's say, the ambition on this aircraft is still there, but it's uh, relatively low compared to the other configurations. Then we have a more ambitious configuration where we have zero carbon dioxide, so hydrogen powered, no, no carbon dioxide in combustion. Uh, and a an, uh, reduction on, uh, on uh, uh, nitrogen oxides. So uh, batteries, fuel cell um, to have the electric path and direct combust uh, combustion of hydrogen together with uh, parallel architecture electro electric uh, drives on the shaft of the turboprop. And the, the third architecture on the right side, uh, the most daring configuration we have in our down selection so far, which is a distributed electric propulsion, um, batteries and uh, hydrogen and fuel cell. The deep dive into energy storage, so battery modeling, we have a partner which is uh, very experienced in batteries. Uh, batteries and battery design has an impact on aircraft design due to the weight connection. So we have uh, two uh, iterative loops interconnected. So the battery sizing optimization, taking into account uh, all electrothermal aspects, the aging, safety, of course. 
So, and then not only on battery level, but on systems level of this battery system, battery storage system. And then the impact on the overall aircraft design and uh, with the aircraft design could be more requirements on energy storage, which then brings an iteration in our design cycle. So this we tried, there we tried to, to interconnect the models of aircraft design and uh, battery design. Energy harvesting, um, energy harvesting by recuperative, recuperative uh, uh, propellers. So um, it has been done, but in this size of aircraft has never been investigated in depth. So we go into the wind tunnel with this, we do modeling, uh, uh, thorough modeling of, uh, uh, of the propellers themselves. And uh, we, we want to optimize the blades for cruise and for harvesting, or we have to see whether this is possible to have a blade that is optimized for both. And uh, then we also want to look at the noise at the air acoustic performance and uh, see what you can gain with this energy harvesting in total. If you, you there is not so much kinetic, uh, uh, no so much potential energy in the aircraft. In the end, it's such a regional aircraft. How much this brings, if it's worth the effort to have energy harvesting by propellers or by some of the propellers, that's one of the questions and we are working on that. Thermal management, just uh, 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 illustration here compared to the human body, it's about the heat transfer between heat sources and heat, uh, heat sinks to control temperature of the aircraft subsystems. We have all these electric components. Think of a fuel cell 50% efficiency, you have to take a lot of heat away in this range of aircraft. And uh, the question is, how can we uh, do this? Not to bring too much drag onto the aircraft, cooling drag, and uh, to find clever ways, clever materials, clever new technologies, how this can be done in such hybrid electric regional aircraft. Next steps. The one, the one thing, as I said before, is the technology roadmap. So how to see um, uh, what is the state of the art, for example, energy harvesting or batteries or fuel cells, what is state of the art there? What would we really need to have a viable competitive product in 2035 or 2040? And uh, to define the gap and to, to, uh, to bridge, to, to uh, provide solutions, how these gaps can be overcome. But again, it's not only about technologies, it's also about the framework in which such an aircraft will operate. So we have to look at the regulatory roadmap. For example, if we have an aircraft with hydrogen, all the regulations around operation with hydrogen and uh, yeah, for example, emissions, emission requirements, uh, and then the certification, the te technological aspect of, of uh, regulations. So uh, high lift, uh, takeoff speeds, maneuverability, redundancies, a lot of new questions with such a hybrid electric power train. And to come to a conclusion, Clean aviation is what we all have to look for, for a sustainable regional uh, development and resilience. Uh, we can think that with these 400 kilometers, we can have a new network of, uh, of uh, operations with uh, shorter ranges, but uh, smaller sized regional aircraft, electric, full electric, uh, if it's commuter aircraft, but hybrid electric in this regional aircraft size. Uh, it is doable. We have to join efforts to get there. Clean aviation, as you might know, is, uh, is, is one of the answers to, to this kind of problem. And uh, we try to bring also our, um, uh, our Footprint 50 results into this framework. Footprint 50, we will design, de de develop open reference architecture. So we will put all this in the network. The models and tools will be available to allow everyone to, uh, to work with his own ideas in this topic. And uh, then we focus on energy storage, energy harvesting and thermal management in depth to get radically new innovative solutions there. And what we all have to learn, and that's why it fits into this session, we have to learn to scale from the aircraft we have seen from Carlin, from Diamond. Uh, we have to learn to scale and, and have to deal with the complexity with the regulations and the integration stepping from one class of aircraft to the next. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, and a uh, very interesting project, which is looking quite a bit in the future, where what fixed wing aircraft can do with electric. <clears throat> so, uh, now we have somebody speaking uh, who's on the other end, who will just uh, 
um, if you could unshare your screen. Uh, um, I'm trying. I'm yeah. busy trying. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. So, uh, it's Barry Rogers. And we go now and you see that we are really a world forum because now we're going to uh, go to the other side of the world, not to China, but even further uh, from our point of view in Germany to Australia, because Barry is operating uh, electric aircraft already for a while. He has been flying quite a while. And uh, Barry, I see you're online. If you try to share your screen, then I would uh, go offline and um, uh, Hi, uh, first, uh, Barry, uh, see you. Yeah, screen is on. Uh, now it's off again. It was on. Uh, you're still muted, Barry, also. Yes, unmuted. And now we look, wait for the screen. Uh, it was on for a second before. Can you check if it's yeah, prohibited? It's no, it should be. It's just lighting, really. We also hear you very weak. No, it's nothing shared at the moment. I can, I will look up your presentation as well. So keep on trying. If not, I may share it from my screen, but then you would have, have to tell me. You have it on your screen, Willie? Yeah, I have it on my screen. And you're a little bit, uh, the, the voice is a little bit uh, low. It's loading as it's, it was quite a big one. I hope that the videos will play. So that's why if you could try yours again would be great um, because I'm not sure if the videos would play here, but uh, I'll try. It's okay, opening. Well, you can see now I'm changing the page, Willie. No, we don't see your screen. Oh. I only see you. Okay, one moment. Share screen. Slide share. Yeah. Screen. Good. Now, yeah, it's coming. Now it's coming. Yes, now we see your screen. Okay, do you have my presentation? Um, uh, uh, we see, no, we see a screen, just a window screen uh, where you have your, ah, now we see the presentation. Now, okay. one step more, and it will go into presentation mode, then it should be fine. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Let me know when you've got it. No, it's up to my, at the moment, it's still the working mode in with the small slides on the side. So if you tap on the icon, yep. on, no, no, on the top, if you, I think it's, if you go a little bit more on top, then it should be presentation mode. Okay. Or, Let's have a look. Um, oh gosh, where are we? If you go slideshow, or the slideshow to slideshow, yeah, yep. and then from the beginning, and then I think it should be fine. Yes, here we go. We are we are there. Very good. We are okay. there. I mute Thanks. myself and leave you the stage. Thank you, Willie, and, and certainly I appreciate being given the opportunity to address um, the audience tonight. I. Um, I've uh, been listening uh, off and on uh, for a few hours and <clears throat> certainly what we've been talking about um, a lot, obviously, is, is the electrification of, of aircraft and, and the fleets uh, globally. Um, what we did, we have a Pipistrelle Alpha Electro in Australia that we own and operate. And what we wanted to do, because Australia is such a very vast country, um, what, what we wanted to do was to basically... Uh, to prove to our governments and, and certainly to our audience and, and potential users the, the viability of the electric aircraft as, as we know it today. So in June this year, uh, we, we set about to ultimately promote the electric plane uh, and certainly the lack of infrastructure in Australia. So um, a good friend, Morel Westermann from uh, Switzerland, uh, broke a record with his uh, Velis last year to fly... Uh, essentially from uh, Zurich to uh, Nordany in Germany. So we had a chat and we thought, well, we can probably do something <laughs> a little better. So we flew our aeroplane um, to try and beat Morel's record, but also to understand that what, what's needed 
uh, globally in terms of, um, and certainly in Australia, in terms of charging infrastructure and, and so on. So um, obviously the aircraft we flew was, was our, uh, our Alpha Electro, very, very small as we all know. Um, I think we're all familiar with the product and the aircraft, so it's not something new to us. But um, to fly it around uh, the outback, the group of people, uh, as you see there, myself, obviously, um, my partner and, and director of our company, um, two very experienced pilots who are both um, now fully aware and fully fully capable of flying the electric aircraft. We had a camera aircraft and uh, a, a third aircraft, actually, to carry our, our charging system. Drivers to, to um, bring generators before and be ahead of the aircraft next arrival and certainly uh, behind the aircraft. And so eight people, uh, five flying days, a very big undertaking. To give you an idea, in South Australia, the record that we wanted to break was 750 kilometres. We actually flew 1,350 kilometres with 24 landings. Uh, not all of them uh, at, um, I would say, airports that are designated, but certainly some, some farms uh, and some airstrips that were essentially... Um, you know, not published as, as airstrips for general use, but certainly we had to do that. And primarily we did not want to retrace our step from point A to point B and back again. So we wanted to, to do a, almost a circular route that took us around um, what is pretty much the outback of South Australia. So it was a very, a very big effort. Um, what we're doing now is just showing you the different legs and, and, and the primary reason for wanting to do this trip was to inform government about where, where is it we can charge an aeroplane. I can tell you the entire trip, we could not charge that aeroplane anywhere uh, at any airport. So the, the purpose of the trip was really to, for government to understand what they need to be doing uh, in Australia and certainly regional Australia about where and how to charge electric aeroplanes. They are coming. We know that. We need to know, obviously, that... Um, uh, we're able to be in a position where we can uh, have a charging station already established at regional ports right throughout Australia. So the, the, my, I guess the, the, the purpose for me was to actually prove that the aeroplane is, uh, the technology is viable uh, and is certainly um, able to be used, not just for flying the circuit or for ab initio training, but going to go somewhere and to come back. So we, we did essentially... Um, as I said, 24 legs. Uh, to give you an idea of the photograph there, as you can see, um, there's nothing there. <laughs> there, is just, there is an airstrip. Uh, you'll see the, the Alpha Electro um, in the, basically on the right-hand side of the picture. Um, and we had a Cessna 172 chase plane carrying our generator system and obviously vehicles to charge along the way. I might point out um, in that trip that the only place that I found in the entire trip was a, a one million acre uh, property that ultimately is a sheep station. And that's where you see the photograph there. That's the red dirt of the Australian outback. Uh, but it was the only place that we found we could actually charge um, the aeroplane uh, off the grid, which was very without diesel fuel. <laughs> so it was very interesting. Uh, fairly iconic photograph as that's come to be. Um, Ultimately, you know, we, we did a lot of legs. We, we made it an educational trip for schools and for students. So you can see the bottom picture there where we had a group of students from the local school came out to, to visit. And, and it, it was very, very big news in Australia, this trip. It took us, as I said, five days um, overall, flying days, eight days um, totally because of the weather, but uh, very, very fascinating. Um, we also, um, in this particular picture here, um, we, uh, our pilot David that you see seated was, was basically uh, at, in the middle of that flight, uh, actually broke, broke the record and you may see him uh, give a little fist pump. He knew that he'd broken the distance record uh, in flight uh, coming back from uh, one of the locations. So we were very pleased to be able to do that in flight and give a little fist pump to show that it was, uh, it was certainly happening. Uh, obviously, what does one do when one breaks a record? I think you celebrate. <laughs> so obviously, we, we certainly um, we did that very, uh, we had to fly the next day. So the champagne was obviously very, um, uh, very minor. Um, 
the record was broken on the 21st on the, on the, in June in 2021. So this is the team that we took with us. Uh, as I said, we comprised uh, two vehicles, two generators, uh, three aircraft, uh, three pilots, and uh, our ground support. So that's basically the crew that you see. Um, obviously, just, just to give you an idea, there's, there's no infrastructure at most of the airports that we flew to. So um, we had to make do, we had to improvise where we could. Uh, we found when we got to this particular airport that we've been using uh, dirt and certainly gravel and, and strips that, that ultimately had an effect on the aircraft. It, um, uh, the nose wheel fairing, as you can see, has been removed because we found we had a significant nose wheel shimmy throughout the flight and realised uh, it had a build-up of mud actually in the fairing. So we removed it and obviously kept flying. So um, This one here is is basically uh, our last leg, I, I suppose, coming into, uh, into Adelaide. So um, gives you an idea that we flew from some very remote strips uh, essentially right into the heart of Adelaide uh, with permission essentially from the uh, the airport owners. So quite happy about that. Um, and Adelaide Airport, of course, are, is, our, is our state um, major metropolitan airport. And we were happy to be able to be given permission to land there. We certainly used very little of the runway and got off it as fast as we could. So, so that's really that's really the essence of the... Of, of the trip there. Um, I'll go back and stop the share on, on that and talk about, you know, I guess the purpose. And the purpose really was to make sure that our government's informed about what charging infrastructure we need. Um, since that trip, we've moved on uh, quite, quite uh, significantly now. We're looking at microgrid uh, charging systems at regional airports that we will, as a company, uh, implement for, for the local owner of the airport or the local government and so on uh, and that to me tells me that we can do as many regional flights or certainly uh, cross-country flights um, when we talk about the range of the pipistrelle with with a one-hour range and certainly a, um, uh, a one-hour charge uh, yes it's a very perfect airplane for ab initio training in the circuit which we do we have we own a flight school and we, we do that every day however um, we need to make sure that the infrastructure catches up to the technology as well to support the aircraft that we're actually introducing and listening today with so many new products uh, coming on the market and, and so many new uh, aircraft that have, will have, uh, I guess, better capability we need in Australia particularly to inform our, our government and certainly our, our airports that um, without the infrastructure support it, then you're not going to get the visitation. So that's that's really the main uh, I guess was the main driver for us to break. Yes, we broke the record and it was fun um, and very expensive. Um, what I'm not seeing uh, globally with a lot of the companies producing uh, new aircraft, certainly in prototype stage or otherwise, is, is actually the um, what's behind that. It's, it's great to have the, the plane and we're flying it and we're test flying at our local aerodromes or airports or wherever, but I'm not seeing... Um, the behind the scenes push to support electrification at, at, at destinations. So that's really become our focus now. Um, and we're, we're pretty excited to actually be a part of it in Australia. It's still the only electric airplane in Australia. Um, hopefully that's not for too long. Uh, we're also looking at uh, development of an electric aircraft in our, own, in our own capacity as well. Not so much to compete, but to actually enhance the um, the fleet capability in Australia. So um, beyond that, I think it's it's really important that these forums allow us the opportunity to speak. Um, you know, in 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 the sense that we you know we're all together in this in this particular project, uh, COVID or no COVID. Um, we've found that COVID here, like you all have, has had severe limitations, but it's also given people time to think about um, what the future looks like and, and, and to continue to develop aviation. So, so very privileged to chat and I'm happy to take some questions if there are any, Willie. Thank you very much. And uh, you really give us a 
close view uh, of the near future of electric aviation, which is great because it's uh, the future is here. You we could say it because you're flying electric and not just talking about it. And uh, we've seen all the difficulties. I think we heard also about the aircraft you're requesting that some manufacturers are on the way producing this aircraft. And sure, the infrastructure is a key problem. Uh, and that's also the our next session. So um, I would just ask uh, the speakers of this session, session, because we have one little problem that due to some technical things, and so we are a little bit behind schedule. And as this year, we are not just online, we are online and real. And as it's the last day of the forum, and in China, it's already getting night, like in your place, uh, the, uh, uh, some of the people have, would have to leave. Um, so you, speakers of the session, if you could uh, briefly unmute, unmute, and I can, if I can ask you if you can do the Q&A of this session after the last session, that would be another one. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, I put in the galleries and I see more. Anyway, we will start with the questions. And uh, first question, now I see you as well. Uh, for the first question would be for, um, uh, for the... Uh, for uh, Andreas Strohmeyer concerning on this uh, new project you're in there. Um, I understand that this is a, quite a long future you're planning on. You're doing start, starting testing, but I know you have had the smaller aircraft, the uh, Genius also. Um, is this still to be continued? Are you still looking forward of perhaps also in a GA aircraft working or is the university now focused more on the, uh, let's say, commuter and larger side? No, we do both. So thank you for the question. We do both. We did not give up uh, small aircraft and now are just in conceptual design. I think one of our strengths in Stuttgart is that we have real aircraft flying at the university, manned aircraft flying. And we just had this summer the first flight of our hybrid electric version of the, uh, of the Genius. So it is flying now on a very hot day, 35 centigrade. So thermal management was working. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, the for seat aircraft, I have to admit uh, that is something for research is uh, compared to what we have now in the Genius, not new. So we would not do it on research. We could do it as a project, but in a spin-off. Um, what we are currently working on is uh, also funded by German government national program. We convert the Genius in the next step for um, electric towing. So a performance optimized electric system mm -hmm. Uh, and also uh, bringing automated functions into the uh, tau plane. So that's uh, that's what we do on the men's side. And on the other side, of course, we are contributing to clean aviation, hopefully, and we work on projects like Footprint 50. Thank you very much uh, for the answer. And uh, I think as we don't have so many people on both sessions left, um, uh, we maybe may do the Q&A for both sessions now together. I think everybody of us is interested in, uh, in the whole uh, environment and the infrastructure is as well very important for the, uh, the fixed-wing aircraft. I, but I, my next question would be to Martin. Um, in Diamond Aircraft, um, on the combustion engine side, Diamond uh, at some point started to produce their own engine, which is Austro engines with a motor for the um, fuels. And um, are you um, also thinking of maybe developing your own electric powertrain? I heard that you have EP as a partner, but for example, for the motor, or do you uh, have a motor partner already whom you can disclose with whom you're working? Yeah, great, uh, great question, uh, Willie. Yeah. Uh, Diamond, of course, um, is producing their, their own engines at, at Astro Engine. And at Astro Engine, we are also looking at, for example, the development, um, electrification, alternative fuels, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but really still on a quite, uh, on a, say, recent development uh, level. Um, and it won't be in time for this, uh, this um, um, EDA 40 project. So we're really relying on uh, suppliers and partners which are able to meet our, our deadlines in terms of certification. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to disclose which uh, 
with whom we are going to collaborate on a, a powertrain uh, point of view. Um, but uh, it's something that you can expect uh, from us in, in the near future. Okay, thank you. Um, so looking forward to the next, at latest at the next eFlight Forum, but I'm sure we probably have some events in between, maybe the Aero in Friedrichshafen, where we will have some news to disclose. Um, I have a question uh, uh, to Rex Alexander, which is on the infrastructure, um, because you showed um, the interest on your one slide, you had this uh, arrangement or the, you showed about the uh, um, use of the parking lots and the negotiations between VTOL companies and the parking lots. Um, I think uh, the two questions in there. One is, do you think there is enough, enough electricity at the parking lots because like uh, for this what or is there a special solution perhaps with batteries or something like this plant on the spot so that you can fast charge enough VTOLs and the second question is there also um, because in Europe I think there are some uh, companies th uh, thinking of uh, working with railway companies and train stations together is such sinking also in the united states at some point no good question willie <clears throat> in looking at the parking lots that was one of the things that i looked at when i was with uber as their infrastructure advisor um parking lots and parking areas uh, lend themselves very nicely to this uh, environment because they have this nice open footprint and I found in looking at a lot of the ones here in the United States in large cities like Los Angeles that um, they they also don't have a lot of uh, encumberments with surrounding obstructions. Uh, you bring up the electrical piece. Uh, a lot of times they probably don't have the electrical capacity that necessary for this industry. However, to be able to run that electrical power in is a lot easier at a parking garage because it's non-occupied than it is at a standard building. So running um, running electricity uh, to the roof of, say, a normal office building is a lot more challenging. Um, one of the things that I know that is being looked at by several different organizations is portable electricity. Uh, so if you think of a fuel truck that goes to the fuel farm, refuels and comes back and then refuels the aircraft. We're actually seeing prototypes being worked on that are electrical fuel trucks. They go, they recharge, they come in, then they have multiple charges for the aircraft, then they cycle those back out. So you can actually move your grid slightly away from where you're actually landing. Uh, there's also um, the capability to bring power in and also put electric storage systems on site uh, to augment for uh, low capacity during peak operating hours of the grid. So, uh, yeah, the um, the concept of using a parking garage is being uh, looked at very, very closely. And I think there's a lot of great pluses there. There's a couple of things you have to pay attention to, but electricity is easier to get to the parking garage, I think. And then when you talk about the other piece in we're looking at heavy multimodal, so I think the key in that space is we don't want the electricity just for EV tall. We want it to be able to provide for buses, cars, boats. So when we create this infrastructure, it's serving multiple uses, not just one. Okay, thank you. Um, and now I have a question which would be to all of you, one after the other, which I think yesterday we had a session on hydrogen fuel cells. So talking on hydrogen fuel cells, um, what do you think? Um, like, would this be an alternative? Uh, perhaps starting with uh, Andreas, um, in your project, are you also looking into fuel cell and hydrogen for the electrification of transport? And then next, uh, like I have you on the screen here, would be Martin, Kalin, uh, Rex and uh, Lars. So Andreas, could you start, please? Yes. What do you uh, think about fuel cell? Yes. As shown in the presentation, fuel cell is, is part of the future. So we have two of the configurations have fuel cells uh, uh, on board. 
uh, together with liquid hydrogen. And uh, we have to see, especially in respect to terminal management, how we can overcome the challenges. Okay, Martin, uh, like Diamond always has been a bit in the lead of developing new stuff. Uh, do you also think on fuel cell and hydrogen? I know you have had quite a while ago the fuel cell aircraft flying, but um, is this still in the thinking? True, yeah, this is exactly uh, where I was uh, thinking about because it was already back in 2007 where we uh, flew one of our motor gliders um, with a fuel cell system. Uh, meaning the technology was already in place uh, quite a while back. Um, it is a massively improved and it, it, we really see it as a feasible candidate to um, say um, make aviation a bit a bit cleaner, alternative fuels. Um, however, uh, parallel to that, uh, and what I think uh, which step is uh, much closer and also more applicable to the bigger aircraft is the uh, direct combustion of hydrogen so instead of it uh, instead of uh, it uh, you first changing it into electricity and using an electric power plant uh say the direct um, combustion of it um, either in a turbine machine or a, a piston machine um, i see that as a much uh, nearer future okay Colin, what do you think about fuel cell on aircraft uh, you're muted Colin. you're muted yeah you're, you're muted uh, you should put your microphone on Yes, okay. Yes, hear me? Yes, now we hear you. Yeah, so I believe in fuel cells. Uh, I give a simple rule. An efficient electric aircraft can fly with battery up to 500 kilometers in the next year with the best battery. But over 500 kilometer is, in my opinion, stop. And after more than 500 kilometers, recording stops. Only fuel cell, I believe, because okay. the energy density of the system complete is much higher than for battery. Okay, that's fine. Uh, then Rex, we'll have also. You uh, oh, sorry, sorry. We'll that's have so also cool. in our company uh, next year. We just started. We have a research project where we install some fuel cells in Electra One as a hybrid version. We combine battery with fuel cell and solar. Okay, thank you. Rex, what do you think when you're planning uh, or when you're, you're planning on the infrastructure? Is fuel cell something because like on the car, you said you want to do the electricity also for other areas like cars, like fuel cell, people also talking on heavy trucks with fuel cells. And so you must have the hydrogen somewhere. Would this be also an option or is this too far out? Uh, no, I think... Um... If you'd asked me this question a year ago, I, I would have said it's probably too far out. But hydrogen has generated a significant amount of um, buzz uh, to the point where the Vertical Flight Society actually stood up a hydrogen council last mm -hmm. year in January. We've had, we have had meetings every month on just hydrogen. I think from the economical standpoint, hydrogen also, I think um, uh, one person already said the energy density if you can make that work, you need less infrastructure. So from an economic standpoint, if I can get that range from the hydrogen, I won't need charging stations everywhere. I could have one hydrogen refilling station someplace. We have those in the United States. Other countries have those in uh, their countries. I've seen the European market embrace hydrogen and spend a lot of time, effort, and money in that space. So what it looks like at the end is hard to say. It may be a hybrid of some mm -hmm. sort, but it may be pure hydrogen yet to be seen. But I think from an infrastructure standpoint, we're seeing a lot of development in that space. And it's, it's very exciting. Yeah, uh, I can tell you, I know from some uh, semi-secret project where people are working on exactly what you said, an EV tall with hybrid where you have the batteries for liftoff and then for cruise, uh, where you don't need so, so much energy than having a fuel cell on board. Uh, but last, uh, Lars, uh, you talked about the development in the BBAA, in the Berlin-Brandenburg area. Are you also having... Uh, projects uh, which are focused on the hydrogen i know about one but maybe there are there is more as well you're muted still 
Yeah. Okay. Um, as uh, as we heard from from Apos yesterday, he was a big part in, in uh, some of our projects. Actually, uh, they are aiming towards having the first uh, market ready product in in that uh, in that area from from general aviation uh, stand of uh, of the industry. Anyway, uh, talking about infrastructure and uh, the CEFA, for example, our technology center that I talked about will include uh, hydrogen infrastructure, of course. The next step would be syn uh, synthesizing from the hydrogen to power to liquid fuels, but that's just to keep on, on using combustion engines, which should be a bridge. But in the end, I think uh, then we will see, see all of it in, in some regard. There might be niches for, for any solution in that. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm sorry, but now I, we have to come to the end. I would like to continue talking with you. What I want to do, perhaps if you could, I would share my screen now and show you some areas where you can find the information which you have had here, all condensed, like we will have recordings, uh, which will be in the internet, we will have the PowerPoints. And so if you want to wrap up later, if you want to contact uh, some of uh, other people later, you can contact sure, always me or us here at Flying Pages or at our partner Z Park in uh, China. But um, there are some possibilities like this stream from today it's already online the stream from yesterday is online we will cut it and uh, post product it for having it a better access but you can have a look at it if you miss something you can see it there so i'm going to show my screen number one two three one number one uh, which is uh, the first uh, uh, slide we have here uh, is, uh, it's not slide, it's actually directly from the web. Like if you go to the eFlight forum site, you click on the live stream um, and then you have the live stream right there. Uh, we stop it for not having interferences and there you can have a look at, of everything which is happening right now, which was happening in the last hours. And um, there later we will do like we will have uh, in the last year in 2020 uh, that you have the schedule and if you click on the schedule you have the recording of each session so you don't have to search so much and um, what we also will have is because most of you probably know that we have the uh, eFly journal the eFly journal is the magazine where we had here uh, the reports on what was going on in the forum but we also have uh, on the eFlight forum, uh, eFlight journal site, uh, we, we have a magazine and we decided to, like last year, to have the next magazine uh, right after we uh, have this uh, uh, digitated all the information we received here on electric uh, aviation on eVTOL. So uh, you have a magazine here where uh, you can have a look and you see, you, you recognize the aircraft you see here. Uh, you have all the information uh, which is from the forum and beyond from uh, like the Electra Trainer, which you have just seen before. And you can do this at any time. And we always update you there. So between, you don't have to wait until the next eFlight Forum to get information from us. Um, beyond this, uh, we have the eFlight Forum in the internet. We also have and this is especially for our Chinese guests. We have the Flying China magazine, and there will be also cover in Chinese the forums and what has happened there. We, and we also have it, and it came out right for the session here, which is the uh, our core product, which is the World Directory. Most of you will know it because it is already available in English and uh, German and French since uh, end of August. But now, uh, like always for the forum, we released also the version with um, in Chinese. Uh, so you can see, you find in Chinese everything which is considering electric aviation, which we always uh, collect over a year. We have some uh information on uh different electric uh, aircraft uh different and 
on the special fields of uh, the development around the globe, we call it the World Directory. Uh, but we also have like uh, the selected uh, all aircraft. You find all aircraft and you not only find all conventional aircraft, I hope I'll, I'll find it now as well in the end because we have all different categories. And in one of the categories, you will see we also have the uh, we, we, we also have the electric VTOL, the EV12 and the electric motors. So if you flip through these uh, pages, uh, you can be sure uh, that you, you will find all the latest updates. Here we have the EV tolls. We have events announcements uh, of, for example, the Aero Friedrichshafen, which will be actually our next big stop event. There will be one event in January in uh california which mike said from the vertical flight society but uh most of it you find it in the directory and since a few years like you see now we have it not only in uh paper form like it is printed uh, in about 100,000 copy and distributed around the world it, you find it also uh, in the internet and here on the Flying China or on the Flying Pages website, you can uh, download it and uh, then see it. And so with this, I close. Uh, this is the next stop, which you should mark in your calendar, where we'll have a forum as well. Uh, the Aero Friedrichshafen uh, at the end of April. Uh, hope to see you there and hope to see you there in person. And with this, and a thank you, very big thank you to our Chinese colleagues, um, and to our sponsors, uh, I, uh, I now give back to you and we will close the uh, eFlight Forum 2021. Thank you very much and uh, see you soon. Thank you, Billy. Mm -hmm.